Are you glad you came to America? Oh, I'm very happy. As a country, I think America is it's the best. Who will treat the immigrants as good as Americans? Yeah. At the end of the day. I actually agree with you, but I won't say, man, America is free, America is great, until everybody's equal. Like, I'm holding out. You know what? Because you were born and raised here. Like, I, feel uh, uh, yeah. I feel entitled to equality mm -hmm. and freedom right. and independence. Because that's the way Because that's what they told me we But had. when I came, you know, 22, 23 year old, as a first generation immigrant, you know, this is a lot better than what I expected. What I uh, Eddie, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Congrats on being one of the first shows coming out of Viceland, man. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, no, Viceland is cool. You got it on your cable channel. I don't know. Cable subscriptions. <laughs> um, how, did it, how did it happen? I mean, I know you had the web series for Vice uh, already, and did they just sort of come to you and say, let's expand it? Yeah, it was really funny, actually. They, uh, they called me, and we had just confirmed like a deal. Me and my agent, and my manager, and my best friend, we're like on the phone, we cut a deal, we're like fantastic, we felt good. Me and my friends started drinking and then like 15 minutes later we get a call and they're like, hey, we want you to know, we love your show so much, we're gonna make it an hour long. And I was like, well, does that mean I get paid double? <laughs> so. Did they say yes? No, so <laughs> we had to negotiate, but it was an interesting negotiation. Did you have any fear going into making the show an hour? Were you like, how are we gonna make it an hour? Do I have that much to say? Are there that many? Stories to tell when I travel around? No, I, I always felt like we had enough. You know, like an hour, it's, uh, it's more work. You definitely just got to do more work, but I'm never afraid of more work. You know, I like work. You get paid more. And, <laughs> and talk about the places that you, uh, that you're, that you travel to in this. We this went to uh, Sicily, Burgundy, Istanbul, Mexican border towns, China, Taiwan, Jamaica, and Orlando. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. What's your favorite? Mm. Well, Jamaica was fly because I got to stay at GoldenEye afterwards for a week. <laughs> so that was fun. But no, I really, I really enjoyed. I think Jamaica and China are the, are the two really powerful episodes that really affected me a lot. But then also Mexico, Sicily, we ended up in jail. Istanbul, we got tear gassed. So it's like something happened everywhere we went. So it's hard to pick a favorite, but I think like the ones that we probably did our best job was maybe Jamaica and China. And you said you went to Taiwan? Yeah, went and to your, Taiwan. Your family's originally from Taiwan, right? Yeah, my mom and dad are born in Taiwan, and then my grandparents were born in China. And then I was born in uh, uh, D.C., yeah. yeah. So what, where in uh, Taiwan did you go back to? Did you go back to like their hometown, your parents' hometown? Yeah, in Taipei. We went to Taipei, we went to Kinding, which is the southern tip of Taiwan, known for surfing and shit like that, night markets. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Why are people laughing? Are there Taiwanese good. people in the audience? Or? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're coming from making this a web series, you know, and in the clip that we saw, we get like 48 minutes with your parents in, in, in Orlando. Was it important for you to produce something like that after, you know, ABC had taken Fresh Off the Boat and sort of told that story in a much different direction, which you have publicly, you know? Yeah, I don't know if people realize, it's kind of fucking weird to watch someone act out your life. You know what I mean? Like, it's just weird. People are like, do you watch the show? I'm like, no, nah, that's not healthy. Like, that can't be healthy to watch someone act you out, you know? And like, they do a good job. The kids are fantastic. I love those kids. And, um, you know, Constance is fantastic. And I think the show's been very positive for immigrants in America. So like, I don't take anything away from the show anymore, but when people early on ask me what I thought, I'm like, I think I'm not gonna watch it because this is weird, you know? Right, that's not like a, and people sort of took that the wrong way. Well, initially you were angry about it, but then you kind of grew out of that and are a little more You know, I got angry because when I went on my college speaking tours and stuff, I would talk, I talk a lot about domestic violence. Domestic violence, really was a definitive thing in my childhood. You know, my parents fighting, um, the kind of discipline that I grew up with, it really affected who I was, and I, I struggled with it for a long time, figuring it out. And so I talked to kids about that, because I think it's important for like older cats like myself to tell people what you went through, what you struggle with, because life's not that easy. It's beautiful, life is beautiful, but there's a lot of struggle to it. And a lot of times people end up on television or they write books and it ends up looking like, oh, it was just fucking easy. Like everything just fell into place, but it's not. 
it's not like you probably have really bad days up here, you know? And I think it's important to go to college and tell kids like, this is hard. You have bad days, you have good days, but you gotta fight through it. And um, when some of these students would watch the ABC show, they were like, hey, I loved your book because you talked about the domestic violence, you talked about the struggle, and it feels like the struggle is not in the show. And I, I agreed with them. And then they would tweet me and send me messages saying, yo, these other Asian kids are telling me don't hate on the show, we have to all support it because it's the only show we have. <laughs> And I thought that was a very strange racial pressure, and I felt bad, like, for both sides, because I'm like, you know, it's like saying, like, yo, I hate this pair of shoes, but it's the only pair of shoes I have, so I kind of have to wear this fucking shitty pair of shoes. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I love that people love the show, but I think other people should be allowed to say, hey, it doesn't represent me, or I want more representation of myself. And that's all that I want people to understand, and, you know, again, I think it is a great show. I think it's super productive. Not everything is gonna be like Wong's World. Not everything's like half-baked and haphazard and you know not rated for kids. Mm -hmm. So you need other things. But um, I just feel that there was a lot of strange racial pressure. Do you feel like it's, it's uh, one of the reasons that it's also important for you to talk about the struggle and to talk about the pain and the work that goes into the life that you lead now is that in many ways someone could watch your show and sort of uh, I would say, take the wrong lesson from it, because in many ways it's a show based on you being you and your personality, and in many ways people wouldn't know that that you being you and you getting a show is based off of so much work. It's like another person famous for just being themselves, which isn't really the case in many ways. Yeah, I think remembering how hard you worked and reminding people that it's not easy is important, because for instance, I remember when Obama got elected and you started reading articles like, are we post-racial? I'm like, nah, man, like, I just got called Charlie Chan in a bodega. Like, there's no way we're fucking post-racial. So, like, anytime there's a successful person of color or a woman or transgender, you know, like LGBT, anybody of difference, right? One of us is successful. We get plucked from the pack, and then we're like, hey, we're over it. Look, we gave this person a job. We gave this person a show. We love these people now. And now you can do whatever you want. You know, and it's not that easy because like I really would never want to be the one person that's like plucked from a category and then leave everybody else behind because the things that I have been able to overcome, a lot of my friends and family and people in my community are still struggling with and I think it's important to remember that. When did you realize that it was important for you to talk about this stuff as well? Was it before you wrote the book or after you wrote the book and it took off a little bit? I just always knew because I'm like, by the time I wrote the book, I was like 29. I opened Bauhaus when I was 27. And so... Love Bauhaus. Guys, if you haven't been to Bauhaus, yeah. it's thank on 14th between 2nd and 3rd and it is fucking dope. Yeah. No, yeah, it's dope. And, and so the thing is, is that I, by the time that... The fried chicken bow, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. No, by the time that I got chose and I got put on, I'm already 27, I'm 29. Like, people have said a lot of terrible stuff to me about who I am, about where I'm from, about my family. So I never forget, you know? You never forget. And you just try to kind of, every step you take, remember where you came from. You know, like, it's something my parents taught me. It's something you learn you know, listening to hip hop, watching history, like remember where you came from. And, and I think that's one of the big things I try to say. When did you realize that you could or wanted to be not just a chef, but uh, a media personality, someone with a show, someone who went on other shows and talked about what was going on? Well, from Jump, I told people, don't call me a chef. Like the magazines and newspapers would come to Bauhaus and they'd be like, oh, you're a chef. And I was like, I'm not a chef because there's a lot more to me than this. Like, I never would allow the job to define who I am. Like, I meet people sometimes and say, I'm a hairstylist, or I'm, you know, I'm a cab driver. I'm like, no, that's not who you are. Like, what's your name? You know, what is your name? Who are you? Where are you from? What do you believe in? What are your values? That's who you are. You're not your job. You know, a job is just something you do. And you should do multiple things. You do many, as many things as you want. But, like, I, I would never let people call me a chef. Because I was like, once you call me a chef, you're gonna box me in. Because I remember when people call me a Chinaman, like you boxed me in. And so I learned really early on as a kid, like don't let people box you in. So you go into making this show and you're doing a food show though. 
specifically, yeah. right? I mean, that's like you ever like notice with NBA, Bourdain. like you, there's a lot of seven footers in the NBA, right? Yeah. And they're like, yo, don't list me as a seven footer. And they'll ask them, why don't you want to be a seven footer? They're like, well, if you're a seven footer, people are going to see you as a center. And they're going to expect you to do the things that a center does. Like, list me at 6'10, list me at 6'11. Now I could play the three, now I could play the four, now I could play the five. So that's how I thought about it. When did the on camera stuff for you started happening, though, after the, after the restaurants? Oh, I've been human crack. You know what I mean? Like, you turn a camera, this shit is fire. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I've just always been who I am. You know, like, the, camera, the camera's just there. So you have this show, though, and then someone approaches you and says, let's do, or I'm sorry, you have this restaurant, and then someone approaches you and says, let's do this show on Vice? Yeah, you know, um, it was a production company that, we, the first thing we did was with the cooking channel, and I knew I didn't want to be with the cooking channel, so I did a, you know, they were like, hey, you should sign this deal. If we pick up your show, you get six episodes. I was like, no, let's just do one. Let's do, let's do one hour long episode. They call it a backdoor pilot. Cause like I never had, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't too sure how the relationship would work out. Cause I watched their other stuff and I'm like, it's kind of hot trash. So I just- Hot trash doesn't have to be bad though. <laughs> yeah, no, but so I just did like the one hour with them or whatever. And it rated really well, and they offered us a deal, so I took the deal, and then my agent hit up Vice, because we'd already been kind of friends and fam, and I did a Munchies video for them back in the day called, like, Getting High on Asian Food, and they let me do whatever I want, so I met up Eddie Moretti for lunch at Colette, and um, we talked. I liked him. He's still my man. He's still one of my biggest supporters. And um, we've continued to work together and it's been beautiful. You know, there was no real big conversation. We had lunch, he watched my tape, and he was like, go make a show. Absolutely. So yeah. one of the things that I really love about this show is that it's not just about the food and what you're tasting, but it's about the food and the culture, how the food affects the culture, brings people together within the culture. I mean, when you have this one in, uh, in, in San Diego where you have this really awesome... Hispanic goth rock band, right? And they're they're all cooking prayers. Prayers, yeah, they're they're really good. <laughs> they are like cooking carnitas in the backyard and like all, all this really incredible food. And then the music starts, and it's not what you would be expecting if you're making assumptions about their culture in terms of the the style of the music. So you're showing people different aspects of cultures that they wouldn't normally get the chance to see. Was that really important for you going into the show? Yeah, it's very important to tear down walls and take the masks off. Because, like, we all wear masks. You know what I mean? We all have our defense mechanisms. We all have the personas that we choose to show the world and we're comfortable showing the world. But we're all very textured, multi-layered, dense identities. And that's what I want the world to see. That's what I want the world to accept so that all of us can kind of stop wearing the masks. And one of the things that I like, too, is when you go into these other cultures, you talk about, or even sort of like uh, other countries, you talk about America, and you talk about America's relationship with these countries. I think about specifically in Jamaica, where you talk about the global economy. Uh, but at the same time, you're not comparing and contrasting America to another country, which is a thing that a lot of travelers do, and I think is a failure to traveling, is you go somewhere and you say, well, well America is like this, and you're like that, when that's not necessarily the point. You want to talk about the relationship. I think you're totally right, because America, that, that is what people do. But America is an ever-present, omnipresent superpower. Anywhere you go in the world, it has a relationship with America. Oh, yeah, be it pop culture or, I mean, be it if whether the or not economy, someone's yeah. conscious of the economy. I mean, what we're doing in the environment. Every single thing America does affects the rest of the world. And I think it's very important to keep that in mind. I think as Americans, we have to be conscious and because we live in a country that is the primary superpower, like, in a lot of ways, we need to think more like caretakers. You know, it, it's election season. You see a lot of these people yelling and screaming about, like, we got to protect our jobs, and we have these issues with these countries and these countries. And I'm like, fam, we got everything. You know, this is, this is probably the most comfortable place to live in the world. We have all the benefits. We should start thinking about, like, what we can do for other people, you know? And maybe it'll come back to us. I really genuinely believe that. Like, you go around, there's enough resources in the world. If we stop being divisive, we stop using so many of the resources for war and conflict, 
I mean, I think there's enough to go around, man. I really do. Like, one of the big things I'm a proponent of, and I've been talking about it, I did a big podcast with Joe Rogan. Like, I think there needs to be a salary cap on the world, and I think there needs to be a basic living income that, like, we give people. And we can roll in benefits and things like that. So these are the issues so I'm the basic, The basic living income that sort of whether you're working or not, you get this wage per, per year. Yeah, because the fact of the matter is there's enough money to go around. Like, I don't think anyone needs to be holding more than $500 million. You're just taking bread out of circulation. Even $500 million, you're laughing and you're right because it's a gigantic number. Yeah. But if you look at the number of billionaires, if you just broke them off at 500 mil and you're like, that's it, that's all you get you to sit You would have enough money to sort of build infrastructures around the world. The question is how you maintain those infrastructures with the money. So yeah. often charities go out and build a well or build an infrastructure, but it's not followed up upon. The people who live there aren't given enough resources to sort of understand how to maintain the infrastructures that are created yeah, for them. Yeah, we need to systematically like detail and inventory the world. Be like, how much food do we need to create? How much power do we need to create? How many people do we need to make this happen? Can we build robots? Can we do this? And then give basic incomes. Like, I genuinely believe in this. It's not how do we educate, crazy. too? How do we, how, do we, how do we educate people? Yeah, and then another concern that comes up in Sicily and Istanbul a lot in this series and Mexico as well is global mobility, right? It shouldn't just be our dumb luck that we're born in America and we get to live in this fantastic country. What about every, look at the people in Syria, you know? Look at the people in Greece. Like, there should be global mobility. People should have the opportunity to go where jobs are. Do you feel like it's dumb luck that you were born in America, considering that your parents are, like, I feel like it's dumb luck that I was born in America because my parents and their, gran and their parents and maybe their grandparents were born in America. But your father is, you know, first generation immigrant. So do you yeah. feel like it's dumb luck or do you mostly feel like due to my father and my mother's hard work, I now, I now have this? Yeah, I had an uncle on my dad's side and it was really his hard work my uncle, my uncle Joe, Joe Huang, Joseph Huang, he's awesome. He like built a few bridges in DC. He was a really good engineer. And because of him, my dad was able to come over. Um, I can't remember how it is my mom got to come over, but my mom didn't even really speak English. And she was 17 and was a salutatorian of her high school. She worked super hard. After school, she worked at a Mexican restaurant. And um, yeah, my parents worked hard. But um, I, I will say, I think I'm lucky to be born here. I was born here. And I think that's lucky, and um, I never take it for granted. How often do you find when you're traveling on the show, or even before you started doing a show, that when you go to another culture, if you're willing to eat their food, you're immediately just sort of welcomed into the conversation and, and sort of a part of it. If you're willing to sort of, I mean, people want to feed each other, and people want to share what they know about themselves and their world, and so often the immediate thing that they know is their food. Yeah. And if you don't know it, they want to share it with you. And I find that immediately opens up doors. Yeah, someone sure, sure, serves you their food, it's like they took off their shirt and you can't be like, oh, that's nasty. Like, you kinda, <laughs> you kinda gotta be, no, nah, you fly, you fly, you good, you good. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's really disrespectful to not eat, and I've eaten some terrible things. Has there ever been anything that you didn't eat? No, I ate all of, I've eaten tuna sperm, I ate fermented mare's milk. Ma fermented mare's milk? Fermented mare's milk. What'd that taste like? Sound of it? The sound of it. I ate camel cheese, and it was like, you ever been to an exhibit at the zoo where the camels are at? It's like I put my head in a camel's ass and ate cheese. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. Where did you eat camel cheese? Mongolia. Mongolia has the worst food on the planet. The worst, worst but worst, I love them. It was my favorite, my favorite place in the world is Mongolia, but I would bring like mad soy lent if I went over there. I would just be eating powdered meals. Mongolia was, yeah, it's a wrap for food over there. Okay, so go, what, exactly, what exactly is camel cheese? I don't know what that is. is they that take just like... camel's milk and make cheese, but camels are so stank. It's like their essence. It's literally like cheese that smells like the zoo. <laughs> like if you made elephant cheese, it was, it was so bad. It was so bad. And what's, what country has the, the, your favorite food? I know you love Mexican food. Okay, I'm, if, if I take out Taiwan, because I'm so, you know, you grew up with that. Um, man, I like Korean food. I'm way into Korean food. Yeah, Korean food is great. 
I really like Korean food. I like Burgundian food. I don't know if you people were cheering because you're yeah. Korean or because you just like Korean food. Yeah. You're, you want to stand yeah. up She's for serious. it. She like yeah. Korean food. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like Korean food. I like Japanese food. French Burgund Burgundian food is incredible. Um, I mean, every, everything is fire, you, you know, except Mongolia. <laughs> Like, they got to do some work. They got some things to do out there. But somebody told me in Mongolia, too. They're like, yo, we just got spices in the 90s. <laughs> like, they're like, we're still figuring this shit out. So, oh my God, it's like, come back in, like, five years. Maybe, you know, yeah, we'll yeah, have a little yeah. more for you. We'll figure out how to finesse oregano, like, by Oh, hey, Eddie, time. you came at the wrong time. Like, yeah. so in five yeah. more years, we'll be good. Yeah. We're but still in the planning phases of our cuisine. <laughs> Give us 15, you're gonna have Mongolian yeah. restaurants in New York City. Yeah, but I'll tell you, if I, can, I, I tell people, if I could recommend one place to go and travel, it is Mongolia. Really? It's, it's because you get this space from society. It's the least densely populated place in the world. So much about their culture is, sub, is about just survival and subsistence, and they're happy. And when you go to Mongolia, you realize life is a lot simpler than we think it is, and you don't need that much. You can shed a lot of the things that you think you have to have in life. And so it taught me a lot. No country taught me as much as Mongolia. And now, uh, obviously, you eat meat. but one, And one of the things that happens in an episode of your show in Jamaica is we watch the... Uh, yes. Right? The goat. We, you see, we, we have a thing. Like, if, if we're going to eat an animal, we try in every country on every episode to show you the animal being slaughtered. You know, you'll see a duck slaughtered in Orlando, you see a live fish turned into sashimi in Taiwan, you see a goat slaughtered in Jamaica, and it's not for shock value, it's you have to see this. Because when you go to the grocery store, it's like under a neon sign, there's like a photo of a butcher holding this meat, and he's like this. <laughs> It's, or it's borderline not even that. psychotic. It's just packaged and like, and, and you know, it just looks like potato chips almost. Too. Yeah, it's just boar's head, you know. But that is an that's a dead animal that was alive. That it had feelings, it had thoughts, it had dreams. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that that ham wanted to do something with itself, <laughs> you know. But now it's your fucking club sandwich. So, <laughs> like. I never woke up being like, yeah, I would love to be Tom's Club Sandwich in like 27 days. Like that, it sucks, you know? And so we show you the animals so you know and you're conscious, I'm gonna eat this meat, I'm conscious of what I did, and like I'm making a choice. How does that affect the way that you taste the meat? Well, it, there's, a more, there's a little sense of gravity to it. You definitely feel bad. Like a lot of people on the crew, they can't eat after it, yeah. you know? I eat, it's my job to eat on the show and I do it, but like I do it with like a lot more humility and I do think at some point in my life when I have the strength and my like lifestyle permits, like maybe I will change my diet, you know? But I definitely try to eat as much as I can, all natural, anti-hormone, antibiotic free, like that's what we serve at Bauhaus. Um, I think that we really need to change the food processes, but also, like I said with jobs, if we can have robots do it and give people income, like if we can create food and we can have nutrition without killing these animals, like maybe we need to let them live, you know? So I think these are things that we have to think about. These are things like people have to make conscious choices about. Because right now the system makes it possible for us to float through life, do these things and not be faced with the choices. Because it's under a neon light, it's cellophane wrapped, and you're like, oh, I'm just eating a brand. Now that's an animal, fam. That's the that's system dead. eliminates consciousness when it comes to food, essentially. Yeah, I think that a lot of our consciousness has been eliminated in the food process. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, questions from the audience. Hey, what's up, Eddie? What's uh, up? My name is Kelvin. It's finally kind of great and dope to meet you because uh, a lot of my friends watch Fresh Off the Boat, and they, it's crazy because I don't know you personally, but they said that. I kind of remind them of you on the show. So it's cool to meet you. Um, I don't see it, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you're really like dope and person, um, down to earth and like I really like that you're just real and just you know smart, raw and just like, you know, um, kind of just like, you know, y yourself. Just like you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess my question is more, um, what's like the greatest 
adversity you faced growing up, you know, or like what, what's like a great lesson you could tell people? That's a good question. I'm going to think about it one second because I don't want to give you like a, a half-assed answer. Um, I think the greatest struggle was myself, right? Like I really think that you have to learn to love yourself, believe in yourself, have confidence that you're good enough, and then every day stay true to yourself, you know? But you fight it. There's a lot of temptation to like change or be normal or kind of say things that don't incite people or whatever. But I think confidence and facing yourself is the biggest struggle for a lot of people and definitely for me. Yeah. Cool. Next question. Hey man, thanks for being here. A lot of important, insightful things you've said. I'm gonna switch gears back to the food real quick. Uh, just what are some of the few ingredients you can't live without? Man, you know, um, there's a good question. Dried chilies, not for heat, but as an aromatic, dried chilies are very important. Like I use chilies in a lot of different ways, not just for heat, but like for the aroma. Um, man, uh, Szechuan peppercorns, again, for aroma, the menthol flavor, the numbingness. And then just, uh, I would say it's not an ingredient, but to answer your question, I think one thing that cooks, young cooks need to be aware of is temperature, right? Let's say something, you have garlic. Well, you could fry the garlic fast, really crispy. You could serve the garlic raw. You could confit the garlic. You could sweat it out a little bit. There's a lot of different ways to finesse, and it's like when you're using an ingredient, think about the temperature you're applying and the time that you're gonna apply that temperature to it. And like that is, the essence of cooking is temperature. So think about temperature. Hey, Eddie. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, how do you profile the people? Do you have a selection process involved? Yeah, you know, a lot of times there's people that reach out to us on social media because we don't want to, we're not trying to meet like chefs or famous people or whatever. Like, we look for honest people who really have an opinion of their cities and countries that we go to because we want to hear from people on the ground, real people with real opinions. What are the challenges that community is facing? What are the things they're proud of? And what it is that they think makes them who they are? And um, the process really is, you know, we use the Google and um, <laughs> we use uh, uh, the search engines and uh, social media, uh, calling people. If you got friends in the city, we'll just call them up and then we Skype them. You know, we Skype everybody, meet them on Skype. So technology makes it a lot easier. but. Yeah, it's kind of just, yeah. Do you find that it's not so much a food show as much as it is a culture show? The food is just kind of the doorway? Yeah, the food, the food is um, kind of the vehicle. The food is the vehicle, but it's a show about identity. It's really a show about identity. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure that as we continue to do the show in future seasons, there's other tackles that we top, there's other topics that we tackle <laughs> through food. Um, yeah, uh, but right now I'm just super focused on identity. I think this is an important thing that people need to talk about. Yeah. I think it's time for one more question. Hello, Eddie. Hello. So I'm also a first generation American and I always have this struggle because my family's from Ghana. So Ghanaians always consider me to be American and Americans always consider me to be Ghanaian. So I was always in like this awkward middle area where I didn't know if I was American or Ghanaian even though I was born here. So since you're also a first-generation American, did you also have that struggle? Yeah, and that's the thing that a lot of people relate to the books about. And my second book, Double Cup Love, it comes out May 31st, is all about that. Because Fresh Off the Boat was about my family and I coming to America, creating our place in this world, and figuring out what it meant to be American to us, right? Not what other people told us it is to be an American. The second book is about me and my brothers going back to China to see if we can be Chinese, you know? And how Chinese people perceive us and if it's too far gone. And the answer was really beautiful. Like, yeah, going back to your motherland, they're gonna snap on you for being American because you don't do things the way they do. But you know what? When they come over here, you're gonna snap on them too. Like, 
I, I mean, I play basketball at African Cats, and they always try to roll up on toms. Like, they roll up playing ball in toms, and I'm like, fam, you're gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> You know, like, I don't know where you picked this habit up, but you're gonna hurt yourself. But like, I'm sure if I went and played soccer in Ghana, they would laugh at me, you know, like out there trying to play soccer in Air Force Ones. So those are the things you pick up on and you notice, but it's not who you are, they're habits, you know? It's kind of just ornamentation. Deep down at the core, it's super important that your family came to America because like, you're still always gonna be connected to Ghana and you're bringing your culture, you're bringing your things here, and you've affected all these people who maybe have never met anyone from Ghana, you know? And the diaspora is extremely important, and we just have to stay connected. Absolutely. Eddie, when, uh, when, well, do you guys want to clap? You can clap. Go ahead. Uh, Eddie, when can people see the show? Yo, Thursday, tonight, tonight is Thursday. Um, I woke up a few hours ago, somebody told me it is, Definitely Thursday, so the show was on in a few hours, 10 o'clock on Viceland. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I believe one of the episodes of the show is, is, is on Vi the Viceland website, on Vice.com. Yeah, the, it's already on YouTube. The Orlando show is up on YouTube, yeah. right? With your the family. Orlando episode with my family is on YouTube right now. Jamaica drops on Viceland tonight. It's a beautiful episode, so I Great hope episode. you guys watch it. The episode with the goat, so you guys yeah. can check it out. Eddie, thank you so Definitely. much for thank being here. Thanks for having me, man.